Uh, Shadow uh, Chancellor Rachel Reef, she is giving a speech. She reckons that Britain is facing 1979 moment all over again. Uh, quicker than I don't know what, Tim, my viewer, said, oh, OMG, Michelle, I would love to have that 1979 experience again. A Ford Capri 3 litre and a new date every night, he says. Uh, Tim, you sound uh, like quite a smoocheroo, but I don't think she means that, quite frankly. I think she was talking economically. Uh, it's got me wondering, do you think this country is as bad as it perhaps was then? Is it worse or better? Your thoughts on that, Quentin? Leonard Cohen le records. That's what I was listening to. Was uh, you? 1979. I remember eating I a, a lot twinkle. of Kit Kats during that election as well. I was Sorry. a twinkle. You were a twinkle. Yes. I used to love a twinkle in, in, in some yes. of our uh, opinion. But uh, no, the, uh, poor old Rachel Reeve, she's desperate for something to say because she's boxed in by um, constraints on spending and tax and all that. So poor old sausage, she's, she's looking for something to say. She's come out this 1979 line. It, it's, uh, I looked, before I came here, I looked at a 1979 Hansard for Treasury questions. Did you? You live the high life, don't yeah. you? Rock and roll, rock and roll. <laughs> and what the, did you glean? The, uh, the comparisons just don't work. Although in some ways, we're worse now. In 19, uh, than we were in 79. The, 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 the national debt is much worse now. It's 85% now. It was 55% of, uh, of GDP in those days. But in other ways, this is, this is nonsense. And uh, if you look at everything from sort of top rate of tax, inflation, in, in, uh, interest rates, it just doesn't bear any sort of comparison, I'm afraid. No? Do you agree with that, Mike? Well, I mean, everybody's misunderstanding this. She isn't saying oh. that the economy is in a similar state now to where it was in 1979. What she's saying was that 1979 was a sea change in the way that our economy was run, oh. you know, from a um, you know, fairly centre-left model to Mrs Thatcher's, you know, very much right-wing free market model. What Rachel's saying is that when Labour gets into power after the next election, there will be a sea change in the way that our economy is run. So she's making that point, not making a point that will our economy is at the same pace. Will yeah, the will, the will. How so? Um, because we will, Labour will introduce, rather not me, um, Labour will introduce a set of policies that will improve the economy, will get the economy growing, which it signally has not been doing What's for the last the 14 key years. One? What's like the big headliner? There'll be investment in parts of the economy that haven't seen investment for a long time. There'll like be free, what? They'll free up planning control so that we'll be able to build housing in this country, which is desperately needed, and so they'll be able to invest in green infrastructure, which is desperately needed. So do you, do you think that's the exciting headliner, this investment in uh, key industries such as green? I mean, don't forget, of course, there's been a bit of toing and froing and slippage in terms of just what will be invested, of course, on that green agenda from Labour. I don't hear anything in, in that, with great respect to Mike, that's really um, convincing it's going to be radical. Every party says, we're going to change the planning system. It's in every manifesto. They all talk about green stuff. Well, actually, a lot of that has happened rather too much in some of our uh, opinion. But uh, I just don't think that um, uh, Reeves and Starmer are going to, uh, if they get, get in, are going to have the, the, the wiggle room uh, for any of this. It's very hard to see where the investment, or spending as it's called, is going to come from. Well, she will argue that we're going to see a decade of national renewal. We have to see a decade of national renewal. I mean, bear in mind, we've had an economy. We've had an economy that hasn't really grown in the last 14 years since the Conservatives came to power. Our wages haven't gone up since the, since the financial crisis, which was in 2008. This is a result of successive government decisions, primarily austerity, the fact that they've just stuck the life out of the economy, a Brexit deal which has harmed our economy, and then the last couple of years you had Liz Trust with the mini-budget, which has caused a disaster, of course, and Rishi Sunak's been there for about 18 months. He's done nothing to fix the situation. We desperately need a new economic model but in this Labour, country. By the way, one we of the new reasons party the in control. economy is so broken is because the whole economy was shut down uh, for a long period of time, literally ground to a halt, uh, because of an illness. And Labour were championing uh, longer lockdowns, perhaps earlier uh, lockdowns, deeper lockdowns, again, with no idea, no consequential thought in terms of, if I do this, what will be the impact on what, anything, whether it's children... When Labour was last in power, the economy grew from when we got in I'm in 1997, right up to 2008 and the global crisis. But you're not answering my question. What's your I'm question? not talking about that. What I'm talking about, one of the reasons that we're in the absolute mess economically that we are, is that politicians of all stripes were desperate to close down this economy during COVID, and that it was an act of self harm economically. I mean, in fairness to the government, the current government, I think they got lots of things wrong in the pandemic. What they got right was that they did put us into lockdown when they had to, which they had to, pre especially pre vaccine, to prevent many, many more people dying, and I'm glad that they did that. But I thought even when Boris was trying to bring us out of that, it was Labour was one of the loud voices in saying, actually, no, we shouldn't be lifting that at this stage. No, Labour largely supported government action and actually government decision-making on when we went into lockdown and when we came out, actually. So do you... 
that's not entirely true. It's not my recollection. They're, 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 it's largely true. Keir, Keir Starmer was saying, no, this is all being um, released, uh, stopped too early. And, uh, okay. I mean, I think... I mean, we'll have to go back through the records, but, look, but largely I think Labour supported government timing on that. I mean, to be honest, at the time, I was one of the people thinking we should have stayed in lockdown longer. And do you regret that now, when you look back and you see the damage? That was no, I don't. I mean, I think, you're in a, you're, you know, as a country, we're in a rock and a hard place. If we, if we hadn't gone into lockdown, if we'd come out earlier, many more, more people would have died. Of course we couldn't make that choice. But granted, lockdowns have resulted in damage. I mean, I'm most concerned about the damage we've done to kids, particularly young kids and preschool kids. Indeed. Which is going to take a long time to undo. So let me ask you this then, right? So if Labour are the answer to everything, there's this fantastically exciting innovation and all this investment and this renewal and it's going to be so exciting we probably won't sleep uh, the night before or whatever. Well, I'm glad you said why, about it. <laughs> uh, why is Lib uh, Wales then not this shining beacon of absolutely everything being in a perfect state? Because Labour have, you know, quite a, uh, quite a lot of uh, opportunity there to be influential and all the rest of it. So why isn't that a shining star then? I mean, because what... Well, I think the Welsh Government has done a very good job. I think Mark Graper has done a very good job. But, of course, they have to work within a United Kingdom in which Labour isn't in power. But Once Labour's in power in Westminster... Them. So, for example, many viewers will get in touch with me in Wales and they'll talk about, for example, uh, the Welsh NX NHS as one of the examples. They've had power devolved to them, schools. but they haven't had extra money devolved to them. So that's the limitation. But so the Welsh Government can have great policies. Raising. I thought they did have some elements of tax decisions devolved to them. I don't think they've got any more tax raising powers than, say, a local council has. I thought they did. So you're don't saying, so. actually, you're saying that the reason that Labour, sorry, that Wales is not a beacon is because they don't have enough money. They don't have the tax raising power, say, that Scotland has. So in Scotland, they can vary income tax do rates. They're in Wales, the they don't. the funds that they've got effectively? Yes, I do. But they've, they've had very limited funds because of austerity, which has been in place for 14 years. So do this wash with you, then, that this whole notion that if only Labour have got more money, everything's going to be kind of some kind of, I don't know what? Most noticeable thing, I live near Wales. Do I you? I live on the Welsh-English border, and... Um, uh, it's the only border that the Welsh have, actually. Um, uh, the, um, the thing you notice most about it is the 20 mile an hour speed limit. And also the fact, in Wales, they're much more liberal about buying coal. So you're allowed to buy coal still in Wales. But uh, it's the speed limits that drive me nuts. About well, they, be they became enforced, didn't they, yesterday? That's to be said, by the way, Mark Drakeford earlier, uh, he's a controversial figure. I wouldn't agree with his politics at all. But I thought there was rather something rather noble about him. And it was rather moving seeing him doing that. His wife died recently and... Um, you know, hats off to Mark Drake for the, the, uh, as he retires from public life, even though some of the things he's done may not be great. I so, think he's a very decent man, actually. Yeah. And, and because we did, we showed that clip, didn't we, where he was getting very emotional. And obviously you don't hear us when the headlines are running, but you actually came in, didn't you, and said, um, you know, he's getting that emotional because perhaps of what happened to his wife. Yeah. Mm. And also, I mean, you forget, Michelle, the, the pressure that these politicians are. I know we all love to complain about politicians, and I'm a sketch writer, for goodness sake. I'm always chucking pies at them. But um, actually, extraordinary pressure. And when they step down, the, there must be just a, um, a sort of a, a release of adrenaline or stopping of adrenaline. Some, but they, but that, they that wanted it that does, pressure. Does, it does. They wanted that pressure. Emotion. They wanted that kudos. They wanted that power. They wanted that platform. But it still comes at a cost, you know, and particularly when you have a family tragedy. It is a choice. It's a choice. But, I think, but he's, he's served for five years. I think he's done a very, very good job. But he's done it. And as was shown earlier, he did have support from all sides of the House, including Conservatives and others. Yeah, I just don't really buy this whole, oh, yeah, the pressure that they're under. Because no one forces You're them. You're a MP. tough old bean. No, I think so. <laughs> So many people, so many people go into politics because they are uh, egotistical. A lot yeah, of them get of drunk on their own self-importance. Yeah, I don't think anybody power. would describe Mark Greatford that way. I'm talking more generally in terms mm. of politicians. I'm not saying I don't have sympathy for him as an individual. I'm talking more broadly. I don't look at any politician when they retire and go, oh, gosh, yeah, but the pressure must have been so difficult. Well, I don't. Maybe I'm a hard nose. You are. Maybe, maybe. I'm a hard nose novel, but to me, you make your choice. You get paid well for what you do. You get a huge amount of, um, uh, I don't know, power for what I hate that phrase. I hate the, the notion that these people seem to think they've got all this kind of power over everybody, but to some, some degrees, they do. Well, we elect and, them to improve people's lives, and Mark Grateful can step down believing that, knowing that he has. You're tough uh, as Norwegian beef. And I wish, oh that, uh, I wish <laughs> that were the case for all politicians. Sadly, it isn't. Which is um, why it's important to you vote for later this year. Well, yeah, and it'll be interesting, actually. Do you think um, Labour will perhaps galvanise people that are uh, disenfranchised, disconnected with politics at the moment? 
I mean, uh, who knows what turnout will be uh, in the next election? I mean, you look at the polls and certainly there's a, I mean, there was a poll yesterday when twice as many people were saying they were going to vote Labour as they were going to vote Conservative. So there's a, there's a massive gulf there. But in terms of what turnout will be, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that I'm concerned about is just how trust have dropped off a cliff, in large part because of jo Boris Johnson being such an inveterate liar. But also I think people have over the last 14 years become quite disillusioned with politics because things have got so much worse in terms of public services, in terms of income, in terms of just people's general well-being. Do I don't think, think, think Boris's fair? lies had anything to do with... Well, they, had, no, no, they will have. I mean, I believe they that. did. But I don't think they had as much to do with uh, the public disengagement as you might think. Funnily enough, I think the fact that Boris got booted out, people voted for him, and then see that the person they voted for is no longer Prime Minister. I think that's been a very... I mean, you can't argue that Partygate that's... wasn't just a, a huge shock to the nation, the fact that the rest of us were Actually, doing our bit no, in, in the pandemic. Funny, funny enough, mean, I would, meanwhile, I would... he was having parties. I mean, that was huge, and that was, of course, the number I, one I, reason for him going. I am going to disagree with you, because actually I don't think it was such an issue on the doorsteps that... Uh, well, I, I had it, I mean, I knock on doors to the Labour Party and people talk to me about it a lot. Yeah, well, I, I think people are more... They don't now, than... admittedly. What a shock to me. I thought it was all a bit pathetic. People were having work meetings and people were desperately scrabbling around, uh, taking pictures from uh, office meetings into gardens. Look at how close they start. They were having work meetings, desperately trying to make I out mean, that when there was work, work meetings. Meeting, don't involve going to Tesco with a suitcase and filling it up with alcohol. And someone had the audacity to bring a bit of cake and celebrate happy birthday at the end. People had a meltdown. I thought it was a bit pathetic, really, and a little bit embarrassing. But uh, many of you will get in touch and say, but that, Michelle, is because you didn't lose anyone during the pandemic. And if I had a have lost someone, many of you tell me, then perhaps I would feel differently. I um, did you do. Did you? Yeah. And did you feel differently about party get as a result? I agreed with you about it. Did you? Well, there you go. Uh, many different opinions, I'm sure, out there. Get in touch and tell me your thoughts. GBviews at gbnews.com.